So we are going to bring this back together to have a series of friends and a song of time that's going to be Right. Right. Am I going to get started? Sure. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome each of you to our seminar. Uh, our speaker this afternoon is David Sherwood. Uh, David taught for a number of years at College Hill Academy. Uh, moved away from the area for a time, and while he was gone, transitioned from teaching into counseling. And so he has recently moved back to this area, has started a practice uh, working with uh, marriage and family therapy. He's also uh, working on a doctorate up at Lee University um, in that area. Uh, his wife is Jeannie, and they have three children, Noah, Luke, and Anna Joy. And he enjoys building relationships with people and helping them step into the glory that God has for them. So we're excited to have him here with us uh, this afternoon. Before he comes and share with, shares with us, uh, let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, you have created us wonderfully. Uh, we are complex beings full of thought and emotion and feeling. And, and all of this is by your design. And even though sin has come in and... and and marred that beautiful design that you've made, you still have a good plan for our lives. You have a plan to heal and restore what sin is broken. And this is, is true in the area of our mental health as much as it is in our physical health or any other aspect of our lives. So we pray this afternoon as we talk about this important topic that you will send your spirit to be here with us. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So, yeah, like Matthew said, um, I uh, re-moved re to the area, I guess I'll say, um, last year. Um, I want to just first share a little bit um, why I'm even standing here today. Um, and kind of the vision that God's been putting um, in my mind and kind of developing over the past several years. Um, based on some of the experiences I've had as a teacher. Uh, that was my first career. I taught um, in high schools for 15 years. Um, started in Michigan, that's where I'm from. Um, taught a public school there, and it's an international school there in Michigan. And I taught in private school at College Academy and also a school for special needs kids I'll tell you a little bit about too. Um, so I wasn't, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't raised going to church. Grew up in Michigan, like I said, as kind of a nominal Catholic. Um, and around about my 20s, um, I just had an experience of, you know, having basically everything I ever thought would make me happy and not being so. Um, and so my girlfriend at the time and I, we uh, kind of started out on um, exploring if there's anything more to life. My mom gave me a Bible when I was 15 when she became a Christian. I didn't want anything to do with that book then. Um, but it somehow made uh, its way into a box every time we moved throughout college, which was probably every, every year. Um, so my girlfriend and I at the time, that's her now, she's my wife, Jeannie. Um, we started reading the Bible and studying it together and making appointments with all the pastors in town at the different churches and trying to figure out what everybody believes about this book and ultimately what do we believe about it. Um, and that process took probably a year and um, to make a long story short for the sake of what we're here to talk about today, um, we wound up landing in an Adventist church. And, um, was at a church, uh, it was probably built for 300 or 400 people, and there's probably 50 people attending on Sabbath, and 
you know, the pews were like the mustard orange color and like the turquoise carpeting and it smelled like the 70s. And, um, and we were probably the only people attending under 70 or 50 maybe. Um, and so it got to be kind of a, a lonely place and um, we prayed and said, God, you got to send somebody here for us to relate to. And um, a, couple, a couple Sabbaths after that, they sent a young pastor to start a school called Arise in Troy, Michigan. And, um, he and that, me and that pastor, his name's David, we've been friends ever since. And then lots of young people started kind of flooding that area. And uh, I ended up quitting my job at the public school I was teaching at and started working for that ministry. And I worked there for three years uh, at Arise. And then 2008 happened and the economic downturn, and they didn't know if the program was going to be sustainable. And so with my teaching background, I sent out a bunch of resumes to all these things called Adventist academies that I really had no idea what they were. And um, so I had several interviews out in California and of course here in Tennessee and uh, Verl Thompson was the principal at the time and um, he hired me as the Spanish teacher um, in 2007. So at that time, we had this little guy, he was about 10 months old. And so we moved from Michigan, 600 and some miles down to the College Hill. And um, it was really a great thing um, for us. The, uh, the community that we had there at the time we were in and our kind of uh, journey as Christians with Adventists and understanding um, just was a really great um, opportunity for us. And um, I was just super excited about um, I have always been excited about making relationships with young people, with students. Um, and now my whole world was expanded to like who God is and who that means I am and who that mean, what that means about the relationships that I am making with these kids. And so I was just super excited to be there and just wanted to have kids over in my house and study the Bible. And, you know, so I remember um, asking one of the seniors at the time, hey, let's have a Bible study at my house. How many people show up? It's Ethan White. You know, and Ethan said, oh, I think three or four might come. And we had this little condo we were in and like 30 kids showed up. Like, that like, all right. We packed them all in and my little guy took his first couple steps of the first Bible study we had in front of all of it. So we just got really just ingrained us and it really bonded us to a lot of kids and families in, that, in the community. Um, so we, I taught Spanish for two years and then there was a, you know, a vacancy in the Bible department and so uh, the administration asked, hey, would you want to transition to teach Bible instead of Spanish? And so I prayerfully considered that and decided to do that. And that kind of ratcheted up even more just um, the closeness I really developed with kids and families. Um, and the thing that I began to notice more than ever is that I would have a kid in my office basically at every three period. And the more that you get to know kids, especially at that age, the more they're just looking for someone to share the hard stuff with in their life. And I heard a lot of stories, and a lot of very hard stories and heartbreaking stories, whether it's addiction or abuse or pornography or, you know, you, you name the things that we go through in today's day and age, right? It usually stays uh, silent. And so I felt pretty helpless in those situations, um, especially the ones with like self-harm and cutting and suicidality and, and um, I didn't quite know what to do. Um, and I knew I was there, I was a friend, I was listening, I got parents involved when that was necessary, you know, and all of those things, but I just felt like there was something more that could be done. And um, so I taught Bible for another couple of years. Um, then my wife was pregnant with son number two. And um, in the middle of, I think, my third year there, fourth year there, um, he had 36 weeks of great checkups, and then um, that 36th week, he was diagnosed in utero with what's called a vein of Galen aneurysmal malformation, which is just a mouthful to say he had a big aneurysm in the middle of his brain. Um, Ten years before, all the babies with this died. You know, they tried to do surgery, and they would bleed out and die. And, but we happen to be living in a time where um, there was a surgery that was able to save a lot of these kids, and so picked up we found you know the surgeon we went to new york and we were in manhattan for a couple months in the nicu um, and so luke was born um, in 2009 and um, he had and has had he's 13 now um, and uh, he's had a, a rough life 
but he has been the clearest revelation of God to me out of anything I've ever experienced. Um, lots of stories to tell about the providential and miraculous things that this little kid, not only in my life and our family's life, but in just about everybody who meets the guy. Um, God's really got a hold of his life. He um, has cerebral palsy, he's 100% care, he doesn't walk or feed himself or talk, um, but he understands everything you say. And um, he's got a smile that kind of changes your worldview. Um, so he was born when we were at College Hill Academy. And again, the community there um, really just lifted us up. Um, one example, I remember a story, we were, it was, he was born on September 21st, my birthday, September 24th. He had a second brain surgery of his life on my birthday. I was sitting in the waiting room, waiting. You know, both surgeries are about eight hours long. Um, and we were sitting just in shock, basically. And uh, I get a call from LeClaire Litchfield, if you know who that guy is. He was the chaplain at the time at the CA. And I picked it up and I said, hello. And he says, hey, David. Uh, Sitting up here at, at the front of the chapel, we have the whole school, 300 and some kids there, and uh, they just had something to sing to you, and the whole school sang me happy birthday as I sat there, you know, and, the, and um, that's just an example of the kind of support that, man, this whole, that whole community was. Um, so that flipped our world upside down. We uh, took a leave of absence for a bit. We really traveled all over the country trying to find the best um, to help our little guy and give him the best life possible. And we basically worked a program, um, traveled to Philadelphia a couple, you know, three, four times a year, worked a program, my wife and I, from the time you got up in the morning to the time we went to bed at night, we did that for about a year and a half. Um, and uh, then, surprise, surprise, we did number three, um, and we were like, what on earth are we going to do? Um, so it turns out that she was exactly the answer to the prayer we were praying that we didn't know we were praying. Um, she was like the easiest baby you could ever imagine. She cut the stress level in her house in half, and she was just an amazing little girl. Her name's Anna Joy. Um, however, adding another baby did bring a lot more strain on us being able to have any semblance of a regular family rhythm. And so we started to look for um, some help for Luke that uh, could give us, you know, that family rhythm. And so we decided, my wife found a, a place called Jacob's Ladder Neurodevelopmental School. It's in Roswell, Georgia, about two hours from here. And um, went and visited, and it's an incredible place. Um, and so they work with kids with all kinds of special needs, whether it's brain injuries or autism spectrum or reactive attachment or all, all kinds of different special needs, learning disabilities. And um, so she went and visited, it was a great place, and so we, she started to commute once a week. She'd drive down and stay two nights and drive back to Luke while I was teaching at CA. And uh, we did that for a couple months, and we realized like this was really probably the best thing for Luke and me for our family at the time. And so I uh, <coughs> tearfully resigned my job at CA as the Bible teacher, and we moved to Roswell, Georgia. And um, Instead of getting another teaching job, I uh, was always in my heart that I, I wanted to be able to do something more for the kids that I have, that I come into contact with. And, and so I um, was, I guess, somewhat skeptical of counseling, therapy, secular psychology world at the time. Um, but I knew that I needed something more. And so there's a school called Richmond Graduate University on a campus in Chattanooga. They have also have one in Atlanta. And so I enrolled, I was going to take a semester of classes and just see like what this is all about. And so one semester turned into three years, and I graduated with uh, my master's degree in marriage and family therapy. During that time, I uh, got to be very good friends with Amy O'Dell, who was the um, the uh, director and the founder of Jacob's Ladder, the school that she founded. Her story is equally as incredible as my little guys with her son, Jacob, who she was told early on that Jacob had this persistent developmental delay that he would never develop, never walk, talk to, whatever. So she said, no, nah, not, 
listening to that. So she started working with him on, his, on her own. Um, she grew from just working with Jacob in her basement to some of her family, friends, kids, moving to different places until she arrived 20 years later at a three acre campus in Roswell, Georgia with 50 students. Jacob was a teacher at the school. Um, so when I was in Bethlehem, we started there. And during that three years when I was in school, we talked a lot and we were kind of dreaming dreams and seeing visions about how to like maybe move the school forward even more. Um, and so one of the things, they, they grew in that time from a three acre campus to a 15 acre campus and then another campus in Buckhead, Georgia. And um, so things grew, double the employees, double the students, double the, you know, the campus. And um, the incredible work that they do with students, one thing that was kind of missing was they didn't have a dedicated mental health services department at the school to work with kids, but also the families. They do this incredible stuff at school and kids would go home and it was very difficult for the parents to carry over. And so they needed that bridge. And so we, would, we talked a lot, I carved out a little bit of an internship there. And then they hired me um, in 2017 to start the mental health services program uh, for the school. And basically when I started, they wanted to start another division of the school called the Hope School. They were getting an influx of, uh, at that time it happened to be teenage boys who were on the autism spectrum, boys that were just coming back from maybe 18 months in a therapeutic boarding school because they had diagnosis of oppositional defiant disorder or reactive attachment. Basically kids that just hadn't found success at any other school and had been asked to leave and this was the last stop. And so there was 11 of these boys when I started and Amy said, okay, here's these 11 boys. We're starting the Hope School and um, we want you to start a mental health services for these 11 boys and their families. And she said, you can do whatever you want. I said, awesome. And so I got to spend a whole year. They paid me a salary. I got to spend a whole year with these 11 boys and it ended up being more than that. Um, and all of my background in education, something I've always been super interested in is creating meaningful learning experiences for groups of kids, but also just super focused on the relational component of that. Now I have more training and education of how to do that. Had a great school, tons of support, lots of teachers, had a treatment team. And so what I was able to do is develop not a program and not a workbook and not something like that, but a way of thinking um, that I found creates a lot of breakthroughs with kids, especially that are going through hard things. And um, so through, I worked there for three years and the Hope School grew from 11 kids to I think there, I think there's over 50 now. Um, and that work was exhausting um, and difficult and messy and scary sometimes, um, but holy. And um, it, it's changed, changed me as far as like how I now see relationships, especially between people above everyone. So I worked there for three years after I became fully licensed in the state of Georgia. I started my own private practice and then I contracted a lot still with Jacob's Ladder. And then this little guy up here turned into that guy. Um, he's almost 16 and um, he was coming to the end of his eighth grade year um, and we weren't thrilled about the high school options in the area for him. And he was a little nostalgic about the school dad taught at. You know, he got to know all the high school kids when he was a little guy. And, you know, so he came to academy days and he visited and then um, trying to decide well, what do we do, do we move, you know, and um, then one of my, two of my very good friends in the whole world decided to move to the area also, and so we're like, okay, maybe it's time that we make the move back. And so we weren't intending on coming back, so again, I tearfully resigned another job, and um, we packed up and we moved back to the area a year ago. And being back, I had to figure out, okay, well, what's next? And this is where like a God has started to put a vision into my mind um, as like what my role might be being back in this area and how it started 
is I came into town and you know, if you're, I don't know if there's any, you know, there's some teachers in the room, you know that if you teach long, I grew up in a family of teachers, my dad and my brother, my you know, aunts and uncles, and my dad in our town knew everyone. We would go out and like, grocery store, gas station, we're like, Mr. Sherwood, you know, like everybody. And so, you know, like that's, you get this huge network of people. And so now with Facebook, you know, when I come back, people knew that I was now a therapist. And so when I came back into town, I got without ever, lots of calls. Hey, could you see me for counseling or my son or my brother or my grandmother? Or my... And so I probably had six or seven of those calls in the first four weeks I got back. And um, the answer in those situations for a, a therapist who's ethical, right, is, well, um, it wouldn't be the best thing for me because I'm your friend connected to you to be your therapist. Um, because when what makes therapy possible you know, to be helpful is being in a room with someone that you know isn't connected to your personal life because it frees you up to be able to talk about anything you may need to talk about. And, um, and so, unfortunately, not all therapists keep those boundaries, right? Um, so I, I had to think, well, I'm not gonna see basically anybody in this town because <laughs> I know so many people. There'll be some that I'll be able to see. Um, but what can I do here? And what I started to realize is, is that I am now the person that I needed when I was teaching at College Hill Academy. And so the vision that started was like, oh yeah, I need to be someone that all of the teachers and the pastors in the area and, and all the rest of us, when we know someone who needs help, that's above our, above our head as teachers, pastors, whatever our roles are, that we, someone we know that we can trust to say, hey, could you help this person find some help? And so what I started was, I didn't know what that was gonna look like. I now have a, an office and a practice, but I just started making appointments with as many therapists in town as I could so I could go and meet people. So that when people called me to say, hey, I really could use some counseling, I was like, oh, I know, I think I'm up to 26 therapists I've met with in the past two months. I can say, yeah, I know so-and-so, so-and-so, and so-and-so, I think this person probably would be, but, because now I know, like, what all of the letters after everyone's name mean, right? To be able to help people find the place that would really be helpful for them. And even more than that, relationally, like, how does that help? So I'm looking now to take the burden off of Shelly Caswell, right? <laughs> Pastors in the area to say, you know, say, hey, if you have someone who really needs counseling, let me be that for you. Um, and so that's kind of the agreement that we started here at Oaks and, and the Ugawa Church is um, for me to be kind of the consulting therapist. I probably won't be seeing personally people in this congregation, but I will be working with uh, doing some like social emotional learning kind of groups and classes with the kids at the school, um, things like this, you know, for the community. Um, but also I'll be kind of the designated referral source, you know. Um, so in a nutshell, that's how I got here standing here right now today. <laughs> um, so this is part of kind of this vision that's been and, and I'm like, this is this this is the job that I feel like I've, I've been brought about in all of my circumstances and experiences to do. And so I'm very excited uh, to be here to partner with you guys. Um, so today, um, oh, there's Luke. And so I, she's 11. She lives up to her name. Hawkins. Lots of uh, miraculous stories about this rescue dog as well. Maybe someday we'll get to talk about it. So, the question that I had when I was a teacher in College Dale, before I really, I'd never been to counseling, I didn't know much about it, but I knew that there were circumstances where we all need more than maybe what only our friends or family can provide in terms of support. Because in our friends and family relationships, we have baggage with them because we're human beings and so are they. And so it can be hard to process parts of our story that are hard with someone that's so close to us. So sometimes it can be helpful. Um, to have someone outside of it. But my question at the time was, well, 
what is the ultimate purpose of counseling? You know, thinking about hard things that happened in the past, like, and like, what, what is that going to do? How is that going to help? Um, and so that's a question I have, and I, I imagine that's still a question that many of us have in lots of communities, especially this one too. And so what I'd be interested to hear from, from, you, from you guys today is what are some common reasons those in our community here might be skeptical about counseling or therapy being helpful? So if you could just for a, a minute or two, somebody near you, what comes to mind when you, when you ponder that question? And I'll give you a minute just to talk about it. Get a share to in a second. The word never looks right to me when I spell it. Did I get it right? Okay, it's got the. I think this one has a British way of spelling it. The British one has no way of spelling it. SSC. Can anybody share what came up? Way in the back. I've often heard from people who are adults now that when they were younger, their, their parents, in a sense, kind of forced them to go to therapy. They had a really poor experience, and I was like, you think adults who want that job? I have a terrible experience when I was a kid, I want to go back. Yeah. Anything that's forced on us, right, that's intended to help, usually is going to backfire. Counseling, yeah, no, that's fine. There's a stigma. Yeah, can especially, you just especially in I would say in Christian communities. Yeah, can you talk about that a little bit more. What is what? Can, what, what what does it mean? Well, um, you know, you should be able to pray a lot, and the Lord will help you fix the problem. Or read and study the Bible more, and you'll be able to fix the problem. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's we get full of sometimes that stigma causes us to feel ashamed if we're yeah. thinking. Hey, if you just prayed more, right? If you just really had better devotion life, then you wouldn't need this counseling and stuff, right? Yeah. We call that kind of spiritualizing the solution, right? Yep. In religion and church, we shouldn't be that way. Ooh, gosh, yeah. You shouldn't be that broken as a Christian. Hmm. We know there's something going on that's not healthy when we use this word too much. Should. I should be able to do this. You know, you shouldn't have to do that. Like, well, who said that? Sometimes we, we say we can sh we should ourselves to death. Like, wh who makes up these ideas? Yeah, what should or should make that's excellent. Yeah, shut up. Um, I hear from kids a lot. Well, what we were talking about is yeah. so just a, a misunderstanding about communication. Communication. I'll say maybe undervaluing and misunderstanding communicating or talking. It's really incredible, and I'll get into this in a second. Like, we now know through neuroscience, like what actually happens in our brain when we go back and talk about difficult, traumatic things in the past with someone who's attuned to us, who we feel a safety with. And when we speak those things out loud that happen to us in that kind of an environment, right? 
we bring that traumatic event and all of those feelings that are coming up all over our lives without us really realizing it. We bring it up consciously in the present moment. And what happens is we shift the way we process that information from this back, you know, fight, flight, or freeze part of our brain to this prefrontal cortex part of our brain. And we have shifts that happen to where we now are not that eight-year-old little David who experienced that traumatic thing when similar things happen in my life today and I respond as an eight-year-old. Now I've done this work, right, to bring that from that part of my brain that in those reactions I had as an eight-year-old that were good because they helped me in that time, but that aren't helping me so much now. And we bring that stuff to the present and we can see how the pathways in our brain change. Um, yeah, I think people are often used to discussing things with people they're close to, so they naturally think, how can somebody who doesn't even know me mm. help me with what I'm going through? Yes. Yeah, no, that, that seems so intuitive, right? It is counterintuitive kind of to think that it actually is a benefit that someone doesn't know me, right? Because then they don't have this lens of knowing you, that they're interpreting what things through. They can be more non biased. But I think that's very generational because my generation didn't hear anything about authenticity. But this, you know, our young generation now does. All of the research that's been done too on what actually makes counseling beneficial or positive change actually occurs out of all the factors it could be right like the skill of the therapist the methodologies of the therapist um, the severity of the problem right the socioeconomic status of the client the education of the all of the things that you could think might add to actual change happening in the ther ther therapy room there's one thing that 100% all the time comes back way far above and beyond the indicating factor of whether or not something positive is going to happen. Let me tell you what it is. It's the relationship that's made between the therapist and the client. And if that client perceives that there's a bond that's made in the relationship that's genuine, that's the factor that makes all those other factors I don't know uh, if some people they need it to make more family and relationship happen in life. You see who can be the counselor. They are very crazy and try to do it. Because sometimes you can go to counselor and explain what they are going to do. Yeah. What they are what tool they are going to do. Yeah. Like I, I would say this is uh worldview differences, right? What is the counselor I'm going to believe? Yeah. Like, do, do we, are we similar enough to where we will see the world from a similar point of view to where this could actually be helpful? And I'll tell you that probably when I was the teacher, that was the thing that concerned me the most, right? If I were to refer somebody to somebody, like, how do I know that they're going to care for this person in a way that's compatible with what we know to be true? And that's why I'm setting out to meet as many therapists in the area as possible. Because if you have a good therapist, that therapist is committed to recognizing his or her own biases, his or her own beliefs, and working within the context enthusiastically with what you believe and what you believe is important. And but that's so difficult, right? And I think us as Adventists, at least I grew up in Michigan, and like my in-laws thought we were joining a cult, you know, because it was it's different, you know. Like, but here it's a little different because we there's many of us here. But yeah, what do people think about Adventists? 
What are people assuming about me because I don't go to the Baptist church or the Methodist? And all those different things. And that's part of my vision as to the role I might be able to play. I'll tell you this, I have these, this Venn diagram. There's my you know, College at Udawa, you know, Southern Adventist University, you know, bubble that I have a big network in. I also went to this Richmond Graduate University that has a big bubble of therapists, right? And now I'm doing my PhD at Lee University. And so I have all these circles and I've, I think I might be one of the only ones in the middle right there. And so I have all of these different, you know, places and I, and I, I think, I will talk a little bit in a second, like my job has always been a connector. So looking to find the people that can be connected to bring about healing, to bring about the other things we'll talk about here today too. Okay, excellent. So the skepticism. So with this in mind, I kind of want to take you through where, where God's brought me in reconciling these things, which I think all of these on this list were a part of me when I first started this journey. All right. Do you want more? Yeah. Um... What happens when you have a person that has a problem that believe doesn't have a problem and then you can't get them to counseling because they're you know resistant to yeah. any type of help because yeah. they're fine. Yeah. You uh you don't you can't this, and th those instances very often, right? Mm -hmm. Like my, my friend said back there, forcing a young person to go to counseling. Can it be helpful in certain circumstances? Maybe, probably, or even if it's an adult. But it, it, it chops off the therapeutic work at the knees, right? When someone feels they're being compelled or forced. Um, we will talk about, though, probably not today, but I'd love to talk about this another time, how to be with those people, what boundaries look like with those people, and what we can do as their friend, their mom, their brother, their sister, their whoever, to move them along the, the line of healing, even if it doesn't look like what we really wish it could look like. Because that is a very heartbreaking, hard, yeah, heart-wrenching and, and overwhelming situation. I have lots I have to say about let's talk some other time about it for sure. These two guys, has anyone heard of Dan Allender before? He's the more famous of the two. He, he's a psychologist, he's a, a Christian. Um, and Adam Young, he's a licensed clinical social worker. I think he has a seminary degree also, Denver Seminary maybe. These two guys have explained the role I believe that counseling and therapy play in the life of someone committed to the gospel better than any one I've ever heard before. Um, and I've only stumbled upon the things that they've been writing and, and saying for, you know, in the past year. And it's, it, it's just, they, they've said so many things I felt in my gut that they just, they just put the words to it. And so I want to share with you some of the things that they've said. A couple of their books, Dan Allender wrote was a book called To Be Told. Redeeming Heartache is one of the more recent ones. And this podcast, um, by Adam Young, The Place We Find Ourselves. Um, if you like reading, if you like listening to podcasts, you know, even just take a picture real quick. Like, um, can't recommend that enough. possibly make counseling helpful, especially for the life of a believer, right? Um, and are, are we, I think we, kind of what you alluded to here, if we as Christians and believers in the gospel and the transformation that Jesus brings to our lives come to the place where we say, I need to go to counseling or therapy, are we somehow like devaluing our experience with Jesus, right? Are we somehow saying that, you know, Jesus isn't enough, right? Or, and even though we may believe that's not true here, right? Sometimes, you know, those things we learn when we're little kids die hard. 
So sometimes we need to be able to think and, and reason through, oh man, what is it? And I feel like these guys do such an incredible job. So here's how Danny Ellender and Adam Young, their colleagues, answer that question. What, what is it that could possibly make counseling helpful, especially for the believer? And he says, the purpose of counseling is to discover the kingdom that has been conferred upon you and to step into ruling that kingdom. So I initially took that in, and I'm like, I feel a little uncomfortable with that statement. <laughs> like, like, because it's saying my kingdom, right? Stepping in and uh, me ruling the kingdom. Now, now, this is coming from two Christians who are not Adventists. But one of the things I think I'm drawn to them is because they use a lot of Adventist language. Because I think they understand this theme of the great controversy in ways that I don't know a lot of other Christians do. So even though I'm a little weirded out initially by this, this language isn't super unfamiliar to us as Adventists because we know that Jesus' work wasn't finished at the cross, right? And at the resurrection, there was the ascension, there was the um, going into the Holy of Holies, right? There's, there, there is a work being done even now that isn't talked about in a lot of other Christian circles. And so both of these guys, they talk about scripture not as kind of this rule book or, or, or manual for life, but as a story, what it is that we are a part of. And so I've loved the context that, that he brings. So the purpose of counseling is to discover the kingdom that has been conferred upon you and to step into ruling that kingdom. And then he goes on and he, brings up Luke 22. I've read this verse numerous, numerous times, but it kind of hit a little different as I thought about that statement. What could make counseling or therapy helpful for a believer? Luke 22, 28 to 30, Jesus is talking to the disciples, and by proxy, he's talking to us, right? The disciples had just got done arguing about who's going to be the greatest, right? And Jesus is there, and he rebukes them a little bit, and then he says, you are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you a kingdom, just as my father conferred one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So this, this language is all throughout scripture, right? Jesus conferred, gave the kingdom, to you and to me. Ephesians 2, Paul, Paul kind of, Paul and the, the first couple of verses of Ephesians 2, Paul's talking about, hey, you all used to be members of the kingdom of darkness and the prince of the air, and we all know who that is, right, was the ruler of that kingdom. And now you've been delivered from that kingdom and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So the idea is this, is like we are sitting with Christ when we become a part of his kingdom just as he has been put on that throne by the Father. So what does it mean to be seated with Christ? You see in Hebrews four different times that Jesus sat down. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his power of word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of heaven. Hebrews 8, we do not have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of heaven. The priest offered for all all time one sacrifice for sins he sat down at the right hand of god sat down at the right hand of god so what does it mean in ephesians when we are sat with christ in heavenly places well what does it mean what did it mean when jesus sat down on the throne in heaven it meant that he was sitting down on the throne to begin his rule over his kingdom because he gave up the earth to the prince of the air for a time 
so that it could be thoroughly demonstrated that the accusations made against God and his character, right, were false. That he actually is who he claims to be. He is love. So Jesus' ascension, sitting down on that kingdom to begin the, the work of restoring all things. And it's not just Jesus who's in the business of restoring all things. He says it's you and he says it's me. Sitting down at the right hand of the Father is a metaphor for the ascension of Christ as the rightful ruling king of the universe. It is the symbolic act of reclaiming authority from Satan. It is given authority for a time to demonstrate the truthfulness of God's claims about Satan and himself. So, your kingdom. Okay, what does that mean exactly? Because I'm not Jesus, I'm not God the Father. He's saying it's my kingdom. Like, what does this mean practically for us? Adam Young says this. And this question hit me when I first heard him say it. He said, what are you meant to do on behalf of the kingdom of God? Jesus has demonstrated that death does not have the final word. So, how would you like to bring the kingdom of God to the world? I don't think I've actually thought about that in that way before. Somebody asking me, hey, how would you like to bring the kingdom of God to the world? What crazy, good, beautiful, lovely things do you want to be a part of? Because there's lots of them. He said, how would you like to bring the kingdom of God to the world? How do you bring to the world your unique self that God has brought through your lifetime of experiences to participate in Jesus' transformation of dead things? So what does it mean that we have a kingdom, that we're sitting on the throne with Christ in charge of restoring all things? We get to sit on that throne and we get to say, I want to do that. I want to make the world more beautiful and accepting and loving and resplendent in that area. And Jesus says, do it. Adam Young says, how are you using the power that comes with being seated in the heavenly realms of Christ. I don't know about you, but I don't feel powerful all that often. But scripture here is saying, you are sitting next to the king of the universe on the throne in heavenly realms. What comes with that is the same power that he has to transform the world. And I think, well, what am I doing with that? Am I taking advantage of that in my life? Pondering this, is what he says, is what, make, is what it means to ponder the question, what is my kingdom? So here's what we've established. We've all been given the kingdom. Now we need to say, well, what does that mean for me? What is my kingdom? Dan Allender says, here are three incredible questions to ask yourself to determine. What is your slice of God's kingdom that has been conferred to you, that you are to rule over? And here's the three questions. Number one, what do you hate? Number two, what do you love? And number three, how has evil assaulted you? And we're going to take a little bit of time today to talk about the answers to those questions and why they're so incredible when we're thinking about what are the boundaries of our kingdom, what it is that we have been created to do as we sit next to Christ on the throne in charge of restoring all things in the world. So, question number one, what do you hate? Uh, I guess what, what is the kingdom of God? So that's where we're going, yeah? So we know the kingdom of God is the kingdom of heaven that Jesus is ushering in, right? And that he says, behold, the kingdom of God is now, right? Those who believed in Christ and confess with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, right? They are the ones who shall be saved, right? So we become citizens of the kingdom of heaven when we confess that, yes, Jesus, I believe what you said about yourself, not what Satan has said about you. 
My allegiance is going to Jesus and his kingdom, not the kingdom of the prince of the air, right? Not the kingdom of Satan. My allegiance now, like in Ephesians 2, it says, I'm moving from this kingdom of the prince of the air, Satan's dominion, and I'm pledging my allegiance to Jesus the Christ. And so that kingdom is the kingdom that now is restoring everything that has been destroyed by the kingdom of the prince of the air, right? So this is this great controversy that we know is going on, right? So you ask the question, well, what is God's kingdom? I think that's what it is, right? Uh, and I have to kind of assume I'm, well, in my case, I drink water instead No, I think we totally agree. And he invites us from the scripture that we read today to not just be passive members of the kingdom. He invites us to be co-rulers of this kingdom with him. Totally. And I would say this, um, in Revelation 2, I think it's the, the letter of the Church of Pergamum, I think, Jesus talks about um, that those who, I think the word is overcome, will be given a white stone. Do you remember that verse? Do you remember what was written on the, on the stone? A new name. And what it says about that new name, right, is that nobody will know that name except for who? Me and the God who gave it to me. Now, it's, it's pretty vague, right? But what is that saying? Name in Scripture is all about essence of who someone is, right? And when Jesus the Christ gives us a white stone, there's a whole bunch of reasons why white stone, you know, at the time, is that, I think, you know, in Roman competitions, you were given, a, if you were victorious, you were given a white stone with your name on it. And there's different reasons why, but it's a white stone. But the idea is this. There is an essence that we have who God created us to be that has been marred by sin. But that essence, that unique part of who we are, is not erased when we give our hearts to Christ. It's just like... You remember Michelangelo who made the Statue of David? He's noted as having said, and people ask him, well, how did you make the Statue of David? Well, I just chipped away all the stone that didn't look like David. And so the idea is, it's like, my name happens to be David, right? Like, God sees in this stone, right? Me, who I really am, who I'm created to be, the perfect glorified essence of who David is, the perfect heart that loves like Jesus loves, right? But at the same time, isn't Jesus because I am still me. And sometimes I think in Christian circles, in our conversations, in our studies, we lose track of that, right? Because, you know, Romans is very clear that there's nothing good in us, right? Yeah. But I would say this, is like, we have been marred to the point, right, where there is no good that we can do apart from Jesus. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a unique essence that God created us to be that isn't still a part of us. And the work of sanctification, right, is God pulling that essence out of us, chipping away everything that doesn't look like David. Do you know the, the no, no, I mean, we have our own identity, we have our own self, but how we 
And yeah, we are, uh, we have, we, the Bible says we have to not consider ourselves yeah. other than God. So. Do you know the best way to observe Jesus is to observe him saying words with your mouth and to observe him thinking thoughts with your brain and to observe him doing things and loving people with your heart. Like Jesus doesn't put his essence that encapsulates me and removes me out of the question. He empowers me to be who he actually created me to be. And so I think this is so important, especially if we are to actually participate in the restoration of all things in the world, to realize there is something special that I bring to the table. There is no one else like me. There's no one else like you. And God saw that you were made and created. And so we have to remember, because if we, if we slip to the, the other side of thinking that I need to be erased in order to be good, then what happens is, is we become very passive. And it's more about trying to stop doing the things that aren't like Jesus than it is about stepping into the kingdom that God has conferred upon me. favorite songs that I think is encompasses the part of the two lines that you sang to be like Jesus. Okay, that's letting him uh, conduit. But the next phrase is to be the one I was created by him. <coughs> so it's the way he wants to use the essence of the person I was. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And we we might feel uncomfortable with that because we're like, oh well Am I focusing too much on myself? But the idea is, is who made you? It's how he uses you. Yeah, God, God made me. Yeah, I'm not. So if I start to see myself as God made me, right? I'm not focusing on myself. I'm focusing on who it is God has made me to be. And if I start concentrating on who that person is and allow them to start chipping away the things that aren't that person, this is what it means to be one with Christ, to have him abide in me. So the question, if we're asking ourselves, what is my kingdom? It's kind of weird thought, it's weird to me anyway, <laughs> like that I have a part of this kingdom. What do you hate, what do you love? How have you been insulted by evil? So what do you hate? Hatred gets like a bad rap in Christian circles, right? Um, but the thing is, is hatred is super important. Um, when we ask ourselves, what do we hate? We're asking ourselves, what is it that I want to stand against when it comes to the kingdom of darkness? And then we take all, all of us and we take our heart and words together. And I mean, that's simple. When we come in church, we think that's simple. We say, we really want to be. And I guess that's the one because we say we hate ourselves because we do wrong things and we don't like what we are. And that will lead to the person to get depressed yeah. because they don't have hope. Mm -hmm. Many people, they feel, oh, I, I am like that. I cannot. They don't, they don't want to go to the church. They don't want to do things because they hate what they are. Mm -hmm. Because they don't, they know the knowledge that is wrong. So then we think, if, if I'm focusing so much on myself and the, hate, and the hate I have for myself, who am I focusing on, right? So we get so caught up sometimes, right? in hating the things that we are doing, but actually, is that is that the essence of who God made me that is participating in those things? And this is a weird thing, and we could talk about different dimensions, and <laughs> how, like, we only get experienced four of them, and like, what does it mean when you bring about a fifth, a sixth, a seventh that God has created, and how can I be this person and another person at the same time? And so we start to think about, God has said, I'm sitting with him on the throne and he's asking me what are you going to do with the power that I'm giving to you to restore the world so Dan Allender is saying okay what do you hate and I think it's asking he's asking here not just oh what do you what don't you like he's saying what specific flavor of evil makes you want to ball up your fists 
I'm going to give everybody a second, to, in just a second, to share some of those things. I want to put a couple more seeds in our brain here before we have that conversation. So what are the things that I see that are contrary to who Jesus is, contrary to love, contrary to goodness, contrary to justice, that get me fired up? Hatred is important to figure out what my role is in the kingdom and bringing restoration of all things. And sometimes we don't allow ourselves to feel emotions like hatred. Now, can you sin in hate? Of course. But can you hate a righteous hate? Absolutely. And I would say if we're not hating a righteous hate from time to time, or even more than from time to time, I don't think we probably have stepped into our kingdom. So bear that one more second here. Two questions. There's the question, what do you hate? But then the question is, what do you hate? And this is where I, I feel like I haven't stepped in fully to this idea of what we're really talking about is this personal relationship and connection to Jesus. Of Jesus not, Jesus is not asking us, hey, here's the test. What should you hate? Yep, that's bad, good. Yep, that's bad, good. Yep, that's bad, good. Jesus is saying, hey, what do you hate? What gets you fired up? What part of all this evil, because you're sitting with me on the throne, we're sitting up here with Jesus, on the throne, looking out over the universe, and Jesus is on the throne, and you and I are sitting next to him, and he's saying, so what do you hate? I don't think I've really ever thought very deeply about that. But I tell you, there's a whole lot of things that Jesus hates. That he wants us to hate too. And I'm not just talking about the things that I do in my life that I shouldn't. So, what do you hate and what do you hate? So I've been doing this for a while now, thinking about what is my kingdom? And one useful tool I've found to start to determine what this is, is number one, just thinking about that question, what do I hate, what gets me fired up, the experiences I've had in my life, right? The suffering that I've seen, the injustices that I've seen, whether it's in my personal life, on TV, or the new, whatever. But also I think about stories that I hear that well up emotion in me. That is a clue as to what your kingdom is. I'm going to play you this, this um, little clip. It's only a few minutes long. Um, but this is one of the stories that I get choked up like every time I watch it. I've been a teacher for 15 years. And that's no mistake. Part of my kingdom involves... when young people are put in situations in which they are neglected or abused or used or put, young people are put in situations where they think the only way to express the rage going inside them is to hurt one another. Now, there's plenty of other things I hate. Like, I hate that so often there's people that, that mischaracterize and misunderstand who the God of the universe is and teach those things, right? I hate that. But, but that's, that's not my kingdom. I'm not a theologian. I hate that more and more, or should I say, fewer and fewer um, corporations are owning more and more of the world. And they are set to make things very difficult for a lot of people just because of greed. Like, I hate that. But that's not what sets a fire in me. There's many things to hate because there's many ways the devil is infusing evil into the world that we're living in. This is one for me I want to share with you. When the SOS went up at a troubled school, who answered the call? A bunch of DADs. Here's CBS's Steve Hartman on the road. Not many good news stories begin 
in such a bad news way. It happened last month here at Southwood High School in Shreveport, Louisiana. Plagued with violence. Over the course of three days, Another fight. 23 students arrested for fighting. Massive police response. But strangely, there hasn't been another incident since. Perhaps in part because of this most unusual crisis intervention team. Nobody here has a degree in school counseling. No majors in criminal justice. Your qualifications are? What day is We decided the best people who can take care of our kids are who? For us. So Michael Lafitte started Dads on Duty. We're out doing what we do for our babies. A group of about 40 Southwood dads who now hang out at the school in shifts. Let's go. Today, any negative energy that enters the building has to run a gauntlet of good parenting. What's going on, buddy? You moving fast. I like that horse. I immediately felt a form of safety. We stopped fighting. People started going to class. How could that be? You ever heard of a look? A look? <laughs> Dads have the power to do that? Yes. <laughs> not many people know it, but yes. <laughs> let's go, let's go. But it's not just the firm stares and stern warnings. Let's make it to class, my son. It's also the dad jokes. <laughs> they just make funny jokes like, oh, hey, your seal's untied, but it's really not untied. <laughs> it ain't 80. There's so bears by it. And it's that perfect mix of tough love and gentle ribbing that dads do so well that has helped transform this school. The school has really just been like happy and you can feel it. Which is why the dads plan to keep coming to Southwood indefinitely. Because not everybody has the father, the father figure at home. More a male period in their life. Like so just to be here makes a big difference. Do you think you stumbled onto something here? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Good morning. They'd like to start chapters of Dads on Duty throughout Louisiana. What's up, big boy? And hope to eventually take on the country. All right. Without a fight. <laughs> Steve Hartman, on the road, in Shreveport, Louisiana. Dads on Duty. So for me, like, who I am uniquely as a person, like, I want to be one of those dads. Kids are in trouble. I want to step in and I want to protect kids, right? I want to do something to bring about the restoration of love in that building. And that's exactly what these dads stepped in and, and were doing. I don't know anything about those dads, whether they knew it or not, but they were bringing about the restoration of the kingdom of God. They were taking a place that was full of violence and they filled it full of laughter and love. So for me and who I am, and as I'm trying to figure out what is my narrow slice of the kingdom, I think it has something to do with this. It has something to do with stepping in relationships and helping people out with what the first kid said. I just felt a sense of safety. Like I wanna be, for me, I wanna be a sense of safety for people, especially kids. And so, like, I've always known that saying these things out loud for me, right, this narrow slice of the kingdom that I feel like God has conferred upon me, like, fires me up. Like, it makes me want to get out and do something and not just worry about what I shouldn't do. So let's reflect for a second. Talk to somebody near you, and if you think about, what do I hate? And here's some clues. Think about like stories that you hear. Maybe they're stories of injustice. Maybe, I don't know what it might be. But what is it through your unique lens of viewing the world that has brought you to hate a certain slice of Satan's kingdom? What flavor of hate, right? Do you feel like is in your heart? Let me talk with each other for a second, see if you can brainstorm some things.
Okay. What do you hate? What came up in your conversations? said that. Something we're going to talk about in just a minute is going to feed directly into what you just said. The idea of that kingdom was not what was wanted. It was another kingdom. And man, I'll say I'll get, the teaser is this. God loves a good reversal. And we'll talk about that in a second. But yeah, excellent. Something else. What do you hate? Um, Martin not the people. <laughs> Stupid <laughs> broken people. <laughs> but the brokenness is specifically from having the lack of love and support from a family. It just, I guess the lack of a loving home. And so you see what you did there, right? You went from brokenness, which is a lot of ways to be broken, but you are, you're getting... Now listen, when we talk about these things, the more granular we can get, the more specific we can get, right? The more that we start to see the contours of our kingdom. And so what you just said was, man, when people feel like they don't have a home, or maybe they don't have a home, and what all of that brings with it is what you hate. Love that. So, now, were you specifically thinking in your mind about a certain age of person? Well, or not really? I guess I mean more towards children. Okay. Um, you know, when you see an adult, you can see that there's some parent that... You see the effects of what happened. Correct. Yes. You said it on the way in of the car. The devil. <laughs> yes. But also, the result of how he ruins loving the whole thing. Okay. How he ruins loving her. So let's, let's go further down the, the, the funnel. Is there something in you, like we're not naming names here or anything like that, but is there a certain description or certain situation, right, 
about broken relationships that, because there could be kids without homes, right? There could be kids that are fighting at school because you know they've been abused you know in their home and they're taking out the kids at school like so it, nothing might come up right now that's totally fine but this is what i would encourage everyone to do is think about okay yeah that, that's the nugget can i get even more specific and it's actually a thrilling thing to do because it starts to give you a vision for something you can do to bring about restoration in the kingdom no but i love that so like What else do you hate? I hate when in our schools the kids that do the best or the best at the smartest get the attention. They, they lose their system for cheating on that. What do you mean? My favorite thing to do when I was teaching was to recognize and sit back and find the kid who's on the outside. And then go to the kids that I know are not on the outside, but that I know love kids, and make relationship with them and say, hey, could you, could you invite him over? Stay with the other one, or play basketball or whatever. Um, and that thrills my soul, right? Because that's part of my kingdom too. Helping people who feel like they're on the outside feel grateful. Am I, getting, am I tracking with you? Is that? I think what you're saying is, I hate it when people are excluded. Next. Isolate others. Isolate. People who are isolated. When people isolate others. Oh, I'm there too. When parents, mothers, their children leaving in our cars. Um, mm. You hear those stories and you... Yeah. In other words, there's no parenting. Or it seems like there's no parenting. So here's the great thing. Child neglect also is. There's lots of ways to neglect a child. But I would encourage you to think, as we walk away from here today, thinking about the stories that constantly come up in your mind, about these specific instances of that. Because that could be the narrow sliver of the kingdom God's calling you to do something about, right? So maybe, like you just mentioned, babies locked in hot cars. <laughs> like, uh, are there lots of specific things that you can think about to give more contours to your kingdom? No, love that. Any other? What else do you hate? Not a lot of hatred going on. The Political division, underline the division, right? Just, and it's like <laughs> the line is here, two people are on either side having the discussion, and then one person takes a step this way, and this person is like, whoa, you took a step that way, I better take a step this way. Oh, you took a step that way, I better take a step this way. Until we all are like shells of our former selves, right? More extreme versions, and the devil loves it, right? Oh, yeah, it's totally contagious. So, man, what this makes me think of is what's, what is the way to combat and to bring restoration in this kind of division? It, it's not fighting fire with fire, right? It's stepping away from the fire. And that's... It's a refusal to, to, to take a side of it and uh, to allow that to impact you the way that you see it impacting anyone else. You might agree with them and whether or not you agree with them or not. Show them that you can do that. 
Yeah, no, I think, I think you could really narrow this down too and find the specific instances in your life, right, that, of that division that we're talking about that really, and then to think about, okay, what does it look like to step into this part of the kingdom? Okay. Next question is, what do you love? And we'll wrap it up here in just a second. Dan Allender, again, he says, <laughs> glory, well, I'll, I'll back up a second. I'm trying to catch this, I'll just read it. Dan Allender says, glory is the resplendent beauty of the goodness of God. Anything that is resplendently good, true, and beautiful bears a measure of glory. How is the way that you are presently living your life filling the earth with more things that are good, true, and beautiful? So here's the thing. Finding the, the contours, the boundaries of our kingdom is not just about identifying all the things that we hate and don't like. But it's then determining what do I love to do? What fills me up? When I do it, I feel like I can die now because I just did that thing that God created me to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I've gone much of my life having no idea what that is. But this is the purpose of this conversation. To start this thinking. And again, how, how can we start to, to understand this? We'll, we'll think about there's probably things in your life right now that you're doing, right? that just fill you up and make you feel like they're alive and you're doing exactly what you're created to do. If you're like most of us in the world that we're living in, it probably doesn't take up most of your time, that thing. And man, if we're in a position to create a life where we have lots of choice and freedom to do what we want, which that is not the case for millions of people around the world, but if that happens to be us, man, what does it look like to really think about that? I mean, how many people are asked to do something and the first thing we do is check our calendar to see if we're available. What if we started checking our kingdom? Because the truth is, when we're thinking about things that define our kingdom, usually we talk about strengths. But here's the truth. Just because we're good at something doesn't mean we're called to do it. Our strengths are meant to support what it is that we are on fire for, the fire that God has put into us. I can't remember what verse it is in Jeremiah, but Jeremiah talks about the word of the Lord being a burning fire inside of him. He can't keep it in. And he was a prophet, right? That was his role. That was his kingdom. What is it about us? What is it, the thing that we love, that we do, that we just can't not do it? if we really started to think about it. Now, again, most of us might not have any idea, but here's some what's inclusive. Think about stories that you see, like those dads for me. I just love them. What are the things that you hear about other people doing or, or see other people doing or you've done yourself that just light you up? You might be looking at some of the contours of your kingdom. In order to identify the boundaries of your kingdom, you need to identify the kind of glory you want to grow on this earth. The more specific, the better. And that's another weird thing that has been occurring to me. Like, we talk about the glory of God, as we should. But what scripture communicates to us is that we participate with God in growing glory in the world by bringing beautiful, resplendent, true, good things into the world. So let me talk for a second. Or maybe we'll just talk together. We need to wrap it up so we don't get... What do you love? What comes to mind when you think about what you love? Shall I? I think of a lady who was in town. She was a social worker and she put her job and she uh, started a uh, hospice for homeless people. She has some corporate support now, but that's what she does. She takes people in that are homeless in the hospital situation. 
Now there is a niche, right? That goes unthought of. And I'm just thinking like how, yeah, like, so you think about like, man, I saw that, that just fills me up. Well, that could be a clue as to a direction or, or the shape of your kingdom. What does it look like? Okay, what else, Shelley? Restoration. Restoration. Shows and things start out broken, ugly, and come out. Well, that's what I'm supposed to be. To me, it's so distorted, and I look for that in people. I want God to restore them in the yeah. art process, at least for me. So, like, art, I think it's, we don't have time to go into that, but like, I heard a story that, you Miles Davis? It, I heard this, Adam Young talks about this. He said that Miles Davis, during a concert, and he played, I can't remember the name of the song. But he played this song, and everyone in the audience was like just silent because it was like so incredible. And they heard him say the phrase nunc dimittis. And nunc dimittis is Latin, and what it means is basically, I can die now. And basically, he was saying, and it's, and it's, what, um, it's what Simeon said in the Latin translation when he held the baby Jesus. So that idea, right, of like, what are the things? So even I go to this, and you see like this beautiful restoration or something that it's like, it, it, it is a metaphor, right? For the restoration, for the perfection that God is right to bring out of our character. I love that. Anything else? What do we love? I'm sorry, what do we, yeah, what do we love? Is something that we love, something if we we're doing something that gives us energy instead of exhausting us. Yes, I'm so glad you brought that up. A good barometer of whether we're doing something that's a part of our kingdom is when we do the burdensome task. Because anything worth doing is going to be burdensome, it's going to be hard, it's going to work, right? But when we finish the burdensome task, are we glad that it's <coughs> over? Or are we exhausted, but we rest in the idea that I just did that thing and I'm energized? If it's the former, you probably are not operating as fully in your kingdom as you could be. And if it's the latter, it might be a clue. Anything else before we hit this last section and then we'll end? Yeah. I usually don't say anything because I didn't know this morning. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, I just thought of this. I love it when someone is hated. You know, like say, I'm just using an example, like cops right now. Mm -hmm. Everybody hates cops. Yeah. They go out and help a little kid or help someone change a tire or let's say some guy is, they think he's a good one because of the way he looks. He's up this little old lady across the street. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You know what it is? Like unlikely friendships. Exactly. Or unlikely people helping people that you would never think. What? I mean, it's the woman at the well, right? Yeah. It's like, that's my favorite story in scripture. Like that idea of crossing barriers to love yeah. someone. So if, I, if I'm this person and I'm not supposed to have anything to do with that person, like the examples you just gave, but then you see that. I think that is the definition of the gospel. And so again, I encourage if that's really in somebody, okay, what does that look like in my life? Who are the people that it'd be very unlikely for you to care about? The least of these, right? <clears throat> like, who are, who are the least of these? What do we love? These are helpful clues. I have another story, but we're getting pretty late here. Should I play it? It's three minutes, or should we just wrap it up? Play it. Yeah, it's raining anyway. Good. Yeah, we get time. This story is another one. When I think about the things that I love, um, this is a kind of story that gives me a strong emotional reaction. Because it's, it's about exactly what you were just saying. And you and I, totally. 
bro, I'm on the same page. We need to we need to talk. Yeah. Um, taking care of someone, protecting someone, rescuing someone, serving someone that's forgotten about or, or on the outside. And I think, who are those people in my life? So here's a, I just love this story. The month it was executed with amazing precision by the Eagles, the Olivet Eagles. Steve Hartman has the play and the post-game analysis on the road. Between classes, they schemed and conspired. For weeks, the football players here at Olivet Middle School in Olivet, Michigan, secretly planned their remarkable play. Did anybody go, this is a crazy idea? No, everyone was in on it. But like the coaches didn't know anything about it. So we were like going behind their back. I've just never heard of a team coming up with a plan to not score. It's just like to make someone's day, make someone's week, just make them happy. The play, which was two plays actually, happened at a home game earlier this month. The first part of their plan was to try to get as close to the goal line as possible without scoring, even if it meant taking a dive on the one yard line, which it did. The crowd was not happy. Quarterback Parker Smith. Look, us kids knew, hey, we got this. This is our time. This is Keith's time. Keith Orr is the little kid in the brown jacket. He's learning disabled, struggles with boundaries, but in the sweetest possible way. Because of his special nature, it's no surprise that Keith embraces his fellow football players. Hug, Gabe. What is surprising is how they have embraced him. Hello. We thought it'd be cool to do something for him. Because we really wanted to prove that he was part of our team and he meant a lot to us. Nothing can really explain getting a touchdown when you've never had one before. Which brings us to part two of their play. If you didn't see Keith, it's because they were so protective of him. But he was in the middle of that rush. And when you crossed the goal line, what was that like? Awesome. <laughs> it was like, did he just... Score a touchdown? Get your Whoa. camera out. I'm like, oh, dude, I can't. Keith's parents, Carrie and Jeff, almost missed the moment, but they got the significance. Somebody's always going to have his back from now until the day he graduates. She's right. When the football team decides you're cool, pretty much everyone follows suit. Today, Keith is a new kid, although by no means was he the only one who was profoundly changed. What was it like for you? It was like, like once I saw him go in, I was smiling like about like here. <laughs> Wide receiver Justice Miller. Like nothing could wipe that smile off my face. Why did it affect you so much? Because like he's never been like cool or popular and he went from being like pretty much a nobody to making everyone's day. Justice admits the play wasn't his idea. I would have not really thought about that. He says it never crossed his mind to give Keith any glory. Well, I kind of went from being somebody like mostly cared about myself and my friends to caring about everyone and trying to make everyone's day and everyone's life. Which may just make that touchdown the most successful football play of all time. Steve Hartman on the road in Olivet, Michigan. It's amazing. I love the words that Justice used. He said, and I know how he was using it, but I just think it's so interesting. He said, no one ever gives him any glory. And I know probably how he meant it, when really the glory of God, something that was good and right and loving happened. And so that really, like that is how we create glory in the world. There's so many ways to do it. I look at this and I'm like, that is, fills me up. I'm like you. I want to like wrap my arms around those who are on the outside. Wrap my arm around those who are in family relationships that are broken. And so it's led me to like, I actually am getting paid now to do the things that are the contour of my kingdom. And it's amazing. But that's something that we all can be thinking about and looking for. What are the things that really outline our kingdoms and how much of our life are we spending in them?
last one that we'll wrap up on, and we're not going to talk about this per se, but how is evil assaulted you? Why on earth would this be a question that we would want to ask when we're trying to determine the boundaries of our kingdom? And I have to say that it might be one of the most important ones to ask. And this goes back to what you said earlier, the two kingdoms, right? And what we're meant for and what we're not meant for. But it also comes, speaks to God cannot be defeated. Romans 8, 28 says, All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. I felt like through this study, I've gotten a little bit more aware even in my own life what that really means. So how has evil assaulted you? This is what Dan Allender says. By harming you, evil unwittingly prepared you to rule your kingdom better than if you had not been abused. I love that sentence so much because it accomplishes a couple very important things. One thing it accomplishes is it implies and really is very clear that we can experience things in this time we have on this earth that are not a part of God's plan. Things he never intended for us to experience. God never intended us to experience cancer or brain injuries or broken families or divorce or drug addiction. That was not a part of the plan for us as human beings to experience. But even though we are experiencing those things, God cannot be defeated by them because his kingdom is utterly efficient, right? Everything that happens, whether it's a part of his plan or not, can be turned around and used against. This is the Joseph story, right? God loves reversals. I mean, th this is hanging on a tree. The hill was called what? Golgotha, the place of the skull. What was that prophecy way back in Genesis? Said this to the serpent. Yes, the serpent will bite your heel, but you will crush his skull. And so we have here at, at the cross, Satan, I don't know if there's any poker players in the room, probably not, but don't tell me. He went all in. Satan said, I'm going to push this, this Jesus to the limit to see if I'll get him to take himself off the cross, right? And it's as if like that, that cross was a dagger in Satan's hand and he was putting it down. And whose skull was he crushing? So the very act of Satan trying to destroy Christ and all of us in the process, he actually was, the thing that was meant to destroy Christ was actually the thing that destroyed him. So there is nothing that can happen that's outside of God's plan that can't be folded into good. But that does not mean you're meant to experience it. So here's the deal. The places that you have been assaulted by evil are not random. There's a great controversy, there's a war going on. So doesn't it make sense that Satan would attack you and abuse you in precisely the area of life in which you were created to bring about the most glory into the world? I'll say that one more time. Where we have been wounded by evil is not by mistake. It's not random, it was calculated. So the places that you've been most deeply wounded in your life, Satan knows that that is the way that he wants to keep it. You wounded in that area. So you will not move forward. So you will not step into your kingdom. So you will not bring more glory to the world. So what's the purpose of counseling for the Christian? 
We need to heal, but we're made for so much more than healing. Because when we heal, when we talk about, think about this, like, how must Satan feel when we as Christians say, the best way to get over the hard things that happened to me in my life is to never think or talk about them again and just move forward. I'm going to leave that area of my life in the past. But what are we leaving? We're leaving probably the biggest clues as to what the contours of our kingdom are. And so sitting with someone who can help us to make those brain shifts, right? <laughs> From the trauma and the bad experience we've had in the past, bringing them into the present, right? To now, instead of eight-year-old David being stuck in that spot where he was abused, where he was hurt, now 43-year-old David could come alongside that eight-year-old David and say, hey, that was terrible. And then that eight-year-old can be integrated into me. so that I then can step into my kingdom. And as you may have noticed by now, a lot of the wounds that I have take place in school when I was a kid. A lot of the wounds that I have involve being on the outside. And as I've waded through a lot of that over the past several years, contours of my kingdom have become much more clear. And now I'm to the point where I'm actually getting paid to be in my kingdom, right? And doing the work. And so that is what is available to all of us. So the question we asked originally is what is the purpose of counseling for a Christian? And, you know, its original answer was to identify the kingdom that has been conferred upon you and to step into that kingdom, fire it up, to do something to bring about the restoration of all things with Christ sitting on the throne with him. Can you um, explain the counseling and then the Yes, um, kind of. <laughs> they basically, for most intents and purposes, counseling and therapy are the same. Um, but therapy, for instance, I'm a marriage and family therapist, but I also have a license as a licensed professional counselor. And so <clears throat> when we talk about therapy, um, counseling basically can mean more than therapy. Therapy is really specifically um, directed towards, um, I guess, what you you could say more serious problems going on. Counseling probably could be described as definitely dealing with those serious things, but kind of sometimes coaching and counseling can get confused. Um, but I would say this, that kind of goes back to what I was talking about in the beginning, finding a therapist and a counselor or a marriage and family therapist or a licensed you know, clinical social worker or a psychiatrist or, or not a psychiatrist, psychologist, all practice psychotherapy and they're just coming at it from different angles. Um, so, that's the short explanation. I will say this, as far as the role that I play here now in this community, I'm trying to expand this role to as, as many people that are interested in our Adventist community, helping people to understand what therapy is about, and that's a conversation we, we, we can expand on for sure also. Um, but the church and I are partnering where they have me basically on a retainer to where if you talk to one of the pastors or you know one of the principals, say, hey, I could really use you know some counseling or my son or my daughter or my mother, whoever, um, they have hired me to be the person that helps to find the person in the area that could be the best fit to do the work that needs to be done. Um, and so you would meet with me, you know, for like one session, and I have a list that's growing of people that to try, you know. And so then, hey, here's three that I think would fit with the things you have going on. Why don't you make an appointment with one, and then I'll call you afterward, and we'll talk about how it went, you know, if it's a good fit. If not, like, hey, let's find someone else that might be might be good. And providing that service is part of what you know, I'll be doing here. <clears throat> So 
So, what I encourage everyone to do as you go home is to think about those three questions. What do I hate? What do I love? How has evil assaulted me? And to start to think more specifically and to narrow down and get as granular as you can about hmm, what are the contours of my kingdom and what does that mean for me? And the truth is, it's like, if it's not, doesn't, if you don't feel excited, but probably nervous about what that could mean, like, then there's probably some misunderstanding about what the, what the task is. Because God is all about, it. there's not, nothing more serious in the world of figuring out what are the contours of my kingdom as I'm sitting next to the, the king of the universe on the throne. But God never intended life to be like severe and harsh and like prep. He, he, he designed us for rest and for play and for excitement and for joy. And that's really the purpose of all of this. The purpose of the counseling is to work through this last part. Where are the places that I've been wounded? And what does that mean for me to heal from those things and move forward? All right. Thank you, everybody. It's still raining, so I'll give them a go. I want to uh, reiterate something uh, that David shared, and that's that he, part of his role here in this partnership that we formed with the Ultua Church and uh, also our school is he's a resource for us, for the pastors, for Shelley over in the principal's office. Uh, when, when people come to us who are, are needing help, He's someone that we can refer them to, not necessarily to, to do that counseling himself, but to connect them with a therapist, with a counselor that can specialize in the area where they need help. So I'll, I'll repeat something that I said uh, this morning during the sermon, and that's that if, if you need help, please reach out to us. There is help available to you. And I, I would hate for someone to be in a situation where they need that help and, and and they're, they, they, they're not asking for it. They're not reaching out because maybe they don't know it's available. Maybe they don't know that it's there. I want you to know that, that we're here to help you. And um, that's why we formed this partnership with David. Thank you so much, David, for coming and sharing this afternoon. Let's close uh, with a word of prayer. Lord, we are in awe of the calling that you have placed on our lives, that you have given us this kingdom, we, we have the honor, the privilege of sitting on the throne with you because you've invited us to. And so I pray, Lord, that each, as, as each one of us reflects on what is that kingdom that you have given to us to rule over. Lord, may we step into that glory that you've created for us. May we experience that fulfillment, that, that joy, that peace that, that, that comes from living in the center of your will and carrying out that life mission that you've given to us. Bless us now as we leave this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for coming. Try to stay dry and uh, drive safe.